Hi, everyone, and welcome. We see the numbers uh, increasing as you all join us in this virtual space. It's very exciting. We're so happy to be with you. While you're joining us, um, feel free to drop your name um, and say where you're from in the chat. Um, if you have questions either now or as we're speaking, uh, you should be able to see a Q&A box. Uh, please put your questions there. We're up to 201. We'll just, we're waiting for people to uh, file in virtually. I'm actually not sure the chat is turned on. So um, when we figure out how to do that, then you can introduce yourselves. And if it's too late to do that, then we'll just say, wow, it's amazing that we have people from all over the country and maybe even all around the world here. So far, we're up to 225. So we'll just give it, um, we'll give it another minute. Great, so we're gonna get started. Um, so excited to see everyone. Um, before we uh, move into the content, um, so first of all, uh, uh, we're so happy to be sharing uh, not just the idea of the Space Toolkit, but actual experiences using the Space Toolkit um, with our colleagues who you see on the intro slide. Um, uh, and before we jump into that, I just wanna give a shout out to our awesome Space Toolkit research team. Um, one of the great joys of doing work at a big university is having so many incredible students who can actually move projects forward. So thank you so much. Big Sam shout out to Holly, Mohima, May, and Millie. Um, great. So before, um, uh, before we jump in, I also just want to give a content warning that um, this next story that I'm gonna share uh, is an experience of sexual assault as students actually shared it with us. Most of our emphasis today is not gonna be on sexual citizens, um, but this is a story that comes from sexual citizens. And we know that in every room, virtual or not, there are survivors. Um, and we just wanna encourage everyone who's out there sharing this virtual space with us to take care of themselves. Um, so Austin was uh, a really, engaging interviewee. He features in the only really spicy sex scene in the book, doing his part to narrow the campus orgasm gap. That's not what we're talking about today. Um, but in the interviews, we asked students uh, to tell us their best and worst sexual experiences. And he told us an experience that he started out by describing as weird, where he was shuffled off to someone else's room so his roommate could be alone with the girl he was hooking up with. Um, he went into that room, the girl lifted up her head, mumbled that she was kind of drunk and didn't want to do anything, um, which is weird, right? Like, why should you have to assert a, a sexual boundary when a stranger walks into your room? Um, and he didn't respect that. He got in bed with her and started to touch her body. Um, we discussed that story at greater long length in Sexual Citizens, but the point here is what put Austin in that room? Um, sure, part of the story is that he made a bad choice 
by deciding to violate her sexual boundary. And in the interview he, was the moment when the penny dropped for him and he realized that he had caused harm. Um, but the take that we have in the book and the idea that grounds uh, the conversation that we're having with you all today is that the main lever that campuses can pull, a main lever that campuses can pull in sexual assault prevention is to think about the spaces that students move through socially, um, the residential spaces and the social spaces as um, something that actually can produce sexual assault as well as producing other kinds of social inequality and modify those spaces as a way to build campuses both with less sexual violence and that are in general more inclusive. So that, that, the, that idea, the idea of sexual geographies takes campus space, not just as sort of like the backdrop to assaults and social interactions, but as a main player. Um, and, you know, we know there is, there's no topic more political on university campuses than space. Seamus and I have both seen colleagues cry because they've gotten offices that they feel don't reflect how important they think they are. And so we know that there's a politics to space, but that's because space is an expression of power. And we saw so many ways in which policies around space actually amplified power inequalities rather than mitigating them. And so the conversation that we're having with our colleagues today is about how campuses can address policies around space um, to unsettle the fundamental power inequalities of race, of gender, of class that create the une unequal social landscape that is part of um, the terrain that produces campus sexual assault. So Seamus is going to give you a little bit more of an intro to the toolkit. Um, and then we're going to hear from, and he's going to introduce our colleagues. Um, then we're going to hear from our colleagues, including um, Brooke West, who's our colleague here um, at Columbia. Um, and then we may even have some time for questions from you all. So Seamus, passing over to you. Um, thanks so much, Jennifer, and thanks to everyone for being here. So, you know, the idea of producing this toolkit in part, as, as Jennifer described, was that um, as we were looking at the life of sexual citizens, so many people said, can we have a thing? Can we have something that we can use to sort of put into place in our communities that sort of make these ideas of the book more actionable? And, um, you know, we sort of thought the book was our thing, but then we realized, you know, there were ways that we could be... Um, um, a little bit more grounded in everyday practices of communities. And so we created the space toolkit. And I suspect many of you who have already have access to it and have seen it, um, it is a completely free resource. So it's something that lives on our website that we revise from time to time in light of understandings that, that are developing. And what it gives is communities a four-step process um, that they can go through to sort of think through how they might analyze the way that space is um, organized in their community, and then how they might change it in a way that centers the work and understandings of the variety of stakeholders within your communities. So the four phases of the space toolkit are commit, convene, consider, and change. And what they involve is having a community sort of commit to supporting um, uh, the work of a group of people in your community who might analyze how space is, is used and may be empowered to make some kinds of changes. So basically this means getting buy-in from upper level administrators. The second phase, convene, means bringing together people with the power, understanding, and shared intention of redesigning campus spaces and policies that might govern those spaces. We Imagine that that convening is really broad. It involves people who are involved in, say, sexual assault prevention work, but also DEI and mental health, people from um, campus dining services and housing, also students and faculty, who some of whom you know, are very involved in issues, some of whom are not involved at all, um, to get the variety of perspectives. Because what we want that group to do is step three, consider to sort of come to an understanding of your own campus's sexual geography, and in particular, your own campus's geographies and how those geographies can augment power inequalities, existing power inequalities. That understanding then leads to change. 
So looking to, under, to see how it is that power inequalities are built into campus life then gives some opportunities for real changes that can be made um, uh, that would advance equity on campus. So that's basically what the toolkit does. It outlines um, uh, these four steps. It's something that's very much in process. Uh, it's free, it's audacious, it's transformational, and I might say it's totally unproven. So, you know, Jennifer and I are social scientists and Brooke are social scientists. And like, we don't just want to sort of give you something to do and then uh, say, well, you know, if it didn't work out, it's your fault. Like we, we want to know that this actually is something that could work. And so we're so appreciative of a group of 12 campuses over the last year that has been on this kind of grand experiment with us. Um, a pilot cohort that has taken a huge leap of faith um, with, uh, with us in trying to kind of implement this and, and see how it works. And part of what today is going to be is that kind of practical experience of what it felt like to go through this or feels like to go through this because many of them are still in process. And so, you know, we have a group of folks here today that are gonna be part of that. There's also many other members of our pilot cohort group that um, won't be speaking today. Um, we're not naming everyone because some of these schools, it's um, uh, still confidential, the work that they're doing. But I wanna say just a huge thank you from Brooke and Jennifer, the entire research team, um, to all these folks who've been um, uh, uh, on this journey with us. So I'm gonna pivot um, now to introducing uh, our panelists today and turning it over to them so that they can talk about in a much more grounded way how they brought about some of the changes or how they got commitment, how they convened a group of people, how they considered sexual ge geographies and maybe how they even made some changes. Um, and so uh, with us today are three members of our inaugural pilot cohort. Um, uh, uh, first we have, well, I shouldn't say first, but uh, uh, we have Dr. Sarah Olenicek, who's the Title IX and Compliance Coordinator at St. Norbert's College, who oversees campus response to gender-based violence and college compliance. And um, Sarah and uh, Jess and Ashley, maybe if you wanna drop your full bios and well, I guess we don't have a chat to drop it in, I apologize. We'll send them around as a, with a follow-up email. Uh, Jessica Adams it manages the Violence Against Women Act uh, grant at St. Norbert College and also works as a local elected official in her community. Jess has a master's certificate in nonprofit management from Regis University. And finally, Ashley Ritterman Loof is the Assistant Director of Advocacy and Education in the Center for Women, Gender, and Sexuality at UMass Dartmouth. Joining them in conversation will be Brooke West, who's been working with us on sort of evaluating, thinking through the uh, implementation of this. Brooke is Associate Professor at Columbia University School of Social Work. So I'll hand it now over to you all. Hello, I think I am first up. I'm gonna go ahead and go right to my first slide. So it's really wonderful to see you all. Um, I'm gonna be talking a bit about the science behind this work before handing it over to our campus partners to talk about their real world experiences. Next. All right, so this work by Jennifer and Seamus really leads us to ask deeper questions about how best to prevent campus sexual assault. So one of the main takeaways is that we need to widen our lens to think structurally about how best to intervene. So what do I mean by that? Well, the first thing to note is that sexual assault is less about behavior and more about the larger environmental context in which students live, work, and play, right? So there's a rich literature in public health that highlights these social determinants and how things like community context or the built environment are actually driving inequities in health behaviors and outcomes. And this is why we cannot address health inequities by focusing solely on behavior change, right? And why just expecting people to be better human beings has not shifted the needle on campus sexual assault prevention. So structural problems require structural solutions. Next. So this is where structural interventions and the work that we are doing comes in. So structural interventions reflect a, a core tenet of public health, that context matters for how health is produced or reproduced. 
Um, interventions like this are grounded in the recognition that social, physical, economic, and political environments shape health, and that shifting these environments rather than individual behaviors is a really powerful and sustainable approach to improving population health. So this encompasses strategies like tobacco taxes or food safety regulations, right? But there's a lot of evidence demonstrating the effectiveness of structural interventions. Um, HIV and sexual health scholars have really been leaders in this space, and they've focused on things like community mobilization, the expansion of services, but also doing things like leveraging health and social policy and institutional practices to create change. Next. So one way that structural interventions seek to promote public health is by targeting the physical environment. Uh, there's growing recognition of the importance of space and place and their effect on health, which has led to interventions that attempt to reshape the spaces in which health occurs, either by changing which spaces harms occur in or by altering aspects of the spaces themselves. So here the focus is often on the social and built environment, which includes sort of social structures and interpersonal relationships within a space, but also all of the physical structures, things like buildings, streets, open spaces, and infrastructure. So both the built and the social environment are also situated in the larger policy environment that shapes how spaces are organized. The physical environment matters because it determines safety, for instance, but it also determines things like access to resources and services and what social interactions can look like. Um, a focus on space and place can and has been used to think about campus sexual assault prevention. Um, for instance, sort of recent work has focused on campus physical environments by mapping hotspots and then modifying characteristics of these spaces to make them less conducive to assault. Um, although attention to campus physical environment is, is not entirely new, what is unique is this focus on the actual landscape of risk as we respond to the reality that people are most likely to be assaulted by someone they know rather than sort of a stranger lurking in the dark. So although structural interventions for campus sexual uh, prevention do not yet have an evidence base, as sort of Shane has mentioned, it is really incontrovertible that our current approaches are insufficient. So structural interventions, on the other hand, uh, represent a sort of a radically different approach. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what this can look like. Next, please. So using these frameworks, Jennifer and Seamus developed the space toolkit, which Seamus uh, described. Again, the toolkit rests on the truth that assault is about power. So as they noted, the spaces that people move through are essential to understanding sex and sexual assault. So on campuses, shifting equity in racial or residential and social spaces through the reallocation of space and power could be a fruitful avenue for preventing sexual assault in a sustainable way. Um, as Seamus mentioned, as we've advanced this work, we're partnering with 12 campuses around the country to do some preliminary testing of the toolkit. Uh, we are using a, a mixed methods approach to learn more about sort of implementation processes and challenges alongside the feasibility and acceptability of the toolkit. So is this something that is possible for campuses to use? Is this something that they want to use? And we're also looking at things like whether and how the toolkit was implemented, what sort of barriers and facility, facilitators existed to implementation, what sort of resources were required to do this work, and, and if what additional supports are, are needed to make this feasible. But we're also interested in sort of perceived appropriateness, satisfaction, and sort of cultural fit. Like, is does this sort of fit within the confines of, of different institutions? So we see this work as a, a first step towards strengthening the toolkit, further testing it, developing packages of technical support, and then eventually disseminating it more widely. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, although the goal of the toolkit is to identify affordable, equitable, and sustainable opportunities to shift uh, campus environments, we fully recognize that sort of structural invention, interventions can be challenging and they may seem incredibly daunting to you in this moment. Um, <clears throat> I wanna take a moment to talk about some of these challenges because they are things that we are actively trying to learn more about in this preliminary phase of the study. Uh, next. So 
conceptually, it can be really challenging to sort of identify processes through which change occurs. So as we conduct this preliminary work, we're really trying to learn more about how campuses define their sexual geographies and then the shifts that follow from that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is going to allow us to better explicate the mechanisms through which shifts in power over spaces can lead to greater inclusion, and then to reductions in campus sexual assault. Next, please. <clears throat> Methodologically, data on structural characteristics can also be difficult to collect and analyze. So we're thinking deeply about how to sort of operationalize and measure these shifting sexual geographies. And then through this process, we're preparing for a future trial to sort of rigorously assess the efficacy of the toolkit. Next, please. But what I want to speak more about, apologies, these slides got a little bit messed up in translation here. What I want to talk a little bit more about is sort of implementation and ethical challenges, because I think that's more relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. So implementation of structural interventions isn't easy, right? They can require a lot of resources and time, which we are trying to learn more about in this stage to make this work as accessible as possible to all campuses who could benefit from it. Um, the toolkit also requires multi-level institutional buy-in that sort of shame is referred to. This includes college presidents and provosts, but you know, also Title IX and DEI coordinators, administrators and student services, facilities, faculty, staff, and students. Sustained engagement is necessary to ensure that intervention activities are actionable and responsive to community needs. So as we do this work, we're really interested in learning more about who shows up and who doesn't and why and also who stands to gain or lose by shifts in power over campus spaces. We're also interested in how campuses are thinking creatively, both in terms of who they engage and how they move through each phase of the toolkit. And as I'm sure you're hearing from our partners, they really have been thinking creatively about this work. Next. Um, ethically, you know, it's also important to consider these factors, right? So many campuses that would benefit most from structural interventions are those that have more limited resources. So in our study, we're really partnering with a, a diverse sample of campuses to learn more about how things unfold in different settings so that we can develop support structures moving forward to make this work feasible. Um, there may also be discordance between intervention goals and local campus culture and norms. So we're trying to learn more about what comes up in these spaces. And then finally, we're putting a close eye towards assessing potential unexpected outcomes, right? Unexpected consequences, both positive and negative. So changes to spaces where students live and interact and the policies that underlie that could create unforeseen shifts in norms and behaviors that we need to assess to ensure that interventions actually advance equity. These challenges are important um, and they are common to all structural interventions, but they are manageable. And so what I hope I've conveyed is that the potential for shifting environments to prevent campus sexual assault is substantial and that this work does hold promise. Um, I think it's more helpful, however, if you hear from some of our campus partners so that you can see how this work is unfolding in the real world. Next. Just a, a quick thank you for your time. I'm going to hand this off first to Sarah and Jess from St. Norbert College and then to Ashley at UMass Dartmouth. Yes, hello everyone. We are grateful to be here today. Um, Jess and I will split our presentation talking about St. Norbert College. If you want to go to the next slide, um, we are just going to start by sharing a little bit about our campus context, um, who we are, where we're located. So we are a college that has really three main parts to our mission. We are Catholic, Norbertine, and a liberal arts institution. We're located in Northeastern Wisconsin, so just outside of Green Bay. Um, we have just under 2,000 students, both at the undergraduate and graduate levels, and we are a highly residential campus. Over 85% of our students live um, and go to school here on campus. Racially, uh, and as we're talking about equity and sharing of spaces and um, unintended consequences and all of the things that are part of the space toolkit, we thought it would be important to note that we are a predominantly white institution, um, which certainly has impacted us as we're going through this work. Um, so next slide, please. 
We also thought it would be important to share a little bit about our campus um, and what has brought us to the place of being a part of this work. Um, so just a few things that are important about the context of our institution. Um, in our recent past, we have had some really difficult campus conversations and occurrences related to Title IX that have led to a lot of the changes that are in place and that we are seeking to think about moving forward. Some of those challenges moved us um, both to having a VAWA grant on campus, which Jess will talk about a little more in just a minute, um, and also my Title IX coordinator role being created as a full-time Title IX coordinator for the campus community. Because of those challenges and those needs, we do also have a really committed campus community that is so involved in thinking about the types of changes um, that we are seeking and what's important to our institution. And that goes all the way up to our top levels of leadership. So Jess, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Next slide. All right, why is St. Norbert participating in the space project? So uh, as Sarah mentioned, we had some existing programs that violence against women at grant, the VAWA grant that we had for three years and then were um, reawarded for another three years. We also had some other initiatives related to culture of respect, Title IX advisory committee. And so that work was intersecting already uh, related to reducing gender-based violence on campus. We also had members of our community who we were working with who were participating in a shared reading of sexual citizens uh, when the toolkit was launched. And because we appreciated the work so much of Dr. Hirsch and Dr. Khan, we were especially excited about this opportunity when it um, became available. So we see the value in trying something new and the space toolkit was uh, a very intriguing opportunity for us to stay abreast of the latest research. Next slide, please. So in getting started, um, as Sarah mentioned, we had buy-in from many um, people on campus already from those existing relationships and from the, um, from the administration high, high level. And we, including those in the book club. And so in the summer of 2022, we worked to recruit some other participants and um, students as well in that. Uh, and we were able to kick off our first meeting in October of 2022. We took some inspiration from the toolkit as to persons who we should include, who we hadn't normally worked with. And, um, and kind of how the layout of the meeting should be. And we landed on meeting monthly um, as a group for about an hour to an hour and a half. In these pictures here, you can see um, some of the breakout groups that are um, that we were working on for our mapping exercise um, as one of the activities in the toolkit. Next slide. So as we've mentioned um, earlier about the multi-level institutional representation and the variety of voices that we want to have represented on our team, we, we made sure to reach out to different areas on campus, which included different people from within academic affairs, student affairs, you can see them listed here, uh, counseling, residential life, LGBTQ, judicial affairs as well as Title IX, HR, the student representation, um, and other people, including community partners with our local domestic abuse shelter and our local sexual assault center. And then I'll hand it back to Sarah. Yeah, our next slide is really just intended to give you all a visual representation of some of the work we've done. Um, these are examples of how sexual geographies were mapped on our campus, thinking about different spaces. So like one of the pictures represents residential uh, sexual ge geographies, one is virtual and so on. Um, as we were getting started and we're about to transition into talking about some of our barriers and our triumphs, Jess and I found in facilitating this that it was sometimes difficult to imagine what our product would look like because we didn't have examples from what went before. So we wanted to have the chance to just share those visuals with all of you. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide, um, you know, as we think about um, 
So uh, the left side of this slide is our triumphs and the right side, side is our barriers. It looks like maybe a little bit of the, the wording got jumbled here. Um, but some of those really high points for us, this allowed us an opportunity to connect with classrooms and faculty in significant ways. Um, we had a faculty member who led her class through a reading of Sexual Citizens in the fall. And Justin and I were able to go into a class and do part of a space toolkit activity with them this spring. And so it's really nice engagement um, in an academic matter on a topic that matters for our students and for our campus. Um, as we've mentioned, we've had great commitment from campus leaders. Um, we've been able to highlight this work to our full community, including our alumni of the college through articles published about the Space Toolkit Project. Um, and one of the things that we are most proud of that we think is really important, um, you know, we were encouraged through the space toolkit to think about ways that we could compensate students for their, their time and effort, um, because when they're spending time as a part of this space toolkit work with us, they can't be working or doing other things. Um, our financial aid office partnered with us and was able to allocate scholarship funding for students who participate in the space project with our institution. And so students are getting $500 a year in recognition of the work they're doing as part of the toolkit, $250 for each semester that they're a part of it. And we think that that's a really significant opportunity to show them thanks for their, their time and their expertise. Thinking about some of the difficulties we've encountered, and I'm sure this is not a shock because many institutions are dealing with transitions, but our um, president and vice president for academic affairs both were called to other president positions at the beginning of the school year. So we had just signed on to be a part of the space toolkit work and two of our top leaders for the institution left. We have wonderful people in interim roles for both of those positions right now who continue to support the work, but that transition is just difficult. Um, we see participation from a lot of the same people in all of the work we're doing. And so those are very committed leaders, but sometimes we miss voices, um, including some, some opportunities um, for really hearing from some of our underrepresented communities on campus. And so those are things that we continue um, to talk through and try and work around. Um, this work, like I mentioned before, is really abstract and it's different. It's different than any prevention work we've done before. And so as we're working through the project, we need to remind ourselves that that's okay and it's okay to be uncomfortable with that um, and keep moving ourselves forward. Um, that is the end of our information. So Ashley, we can go to the next slide and hand it over to you. All right, thank you all so much. Um, it's great to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I am so looking forward to telling you all a little bit about UMass Dartmouth's experience um, with the Space Toolkit. Um, if we can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so UMass Dartmouth, um, we have joined the Space Toolkit um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, last spring, I taught a 300 level course on campus sexual violence and had the opportunity to teach the entirety of sexual citizens and found that this text really impacted students and forced them to think about sexual violence and prevention work in a completely new way. So by the time the toolkit was released over the course of summer 2022, it seemed like a really natural and organic extension um, to pursue at that time. So I think that sexual violence, um, as a person who works in both sexual violence prevention and indirect advocacy um, at UMass Dartmouth, um, it feels as if sexual violence is often left out of the DEI conversation. And so to take a toolkit that offers a structured path forward um, that unites both equity um, and diversity concerns with sexual violence prevention, again, seemed like another organic step forward. Um, I appreciate um, Dr. Hirsch and Dr. Khan's novel approach to persisting problems. And again, why not try and see what happens? In terms of demographics at UMass Dartmouth, um, there are a couple key facts and figures. We are 60 miles south of Boston and have about just over 7,700 students between our undergraduate, graduate, and law enrollment. We have 35% of students are students of color, half of our students are first gen, and just about 45% live on campus. I would be remiss in looking at our campus space um, if I didn't highlight our physical, what our physical landscape looks like. 
So if we can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so our campus was designed by the architect Paul Rudolph, who specialized in brutalism. So I've got a couple of photos of campus included in this slide deck um, that really highlight the gray concrete. Certainly you can see it behind me with my scalloped concrete walls, um, but ultimately the immutability um, of this space that really does impact our students, um, staff and faculty, just in terms of what we look like. Um, but that's not to say that our capital projects don't head in completely other directions. Um, next slide, please. I have photos here um, of our new first year residence halls that were launched in the soft launched in the fall of 2020 due to COVID. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what P3 means. So in terms of public private partnerships um, that allowed for these buildings to exist. So we can really see a stark contrast in what our first year students, the space that our first year students get to occupy versus what the rest of the campus sort of looks like. Um, so I'll definitely highlight that in a couple of high, in a couple of points here coming on. So in terms of our space task force composition, um, I want to highlight, as my colleagues at St. Norbert's did, um, the composition of this group and what invitations were extended and to whom. So it's no surprise that a lot of student affairs professionals were asked, much like my colleagues at St. Norbert's, um, we have the same people in the same rooms often for certain conversations. And so relying upon those partnerships um, has been a huge asset and feather in my cap um, as I have led this initiative forward. So plenty of folks from student affairs, um, my colleagues in the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, including the Chief Diversity Officer and Title IX Coordinator, that is one person doing both jobs, as well as one of our Title IX investigators have been huge supports in this work. Additional members include folks from academic affairs, athletics, and offices, including um, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Administrative Operations and Compliance, which again have just broadened our perspective of how this campus functions in ways that we might not always recognize. When it comes to student participation, I want to highlight what types of students we have in this group. We've had about 10 work with us over the course of the academic year, um, all of whom represent a variety of different identities. Um, it's important to note that each student has checked multiple boxes, but one of the questions that has remained at the forefront of my mind is, how do we avoid tokenizing experiences? One of the ways we've combated that has to do with continuing to incorporate students um, into this work even after we've gotten started. So in a sort of rolling participant way, if a space task force member says, hey, I have a friend who I think would really be interested in this work, we will absolutely extend an invitation to that person to include them so that they have the opportunity to participate and um, round out, I think, student experiences in a meaningful way. Another issue that I wanted to draw attention to has to do with compensation. So because of the way that our student demographics work, it is not uncommon for our students to have multiple jobs on campus. So maybe they might have a work study appointment, but they might also be tutoring and making sure that we are able to pay students and find a way forward for compensation when they are up against a 20 hour employment cap um, in terms of their hours per week has been something that we've struggled with um, in terms of getting creative about working around that. Um, so that's just something to be aware of based on the campus that you might be working on. A couple of barriers. Um, I think that understanding sexual geography, sexual citizens does an outstanding job outlining an analysis that is digestible and easy to understand. However, actually making sure or providing a space where students, faculty and staff can gain confidence with this analysis and apply it to our campus has been tricky. Um, so just making sure that people have again, an understanding of what we actually mean when we're thinking about space and sexual geographies takes a lot of time. And there have been moments over the course of the year where we've had to pause to spend more time grappling with that concept. At times I have noticed um, that there is tension amongst students and staff. When students share their lived experiences, sometimes staff and faculty get a little bit defensive when it comes to explaining either a university policy or a response and feel the need to myth bust um, what actually happened, which sometimes stands in contrast to or has the potential to undermine student experiences. So just attending to that tension in the room has been something that I have had to think through as a facilitator, but also as a colleague and as a resource to students. 
Logistics are a challenge when you have a large group. I think we can all share that in common. Um, figuring out what meeting cadence works best for this group and making sure that we can work around students' schedules, as well as acknowledging that staff and faculty are unlikely to stay after hours for meetings, um, has been difficult. One of the things that we did this spring was split our once um, our main group meeting to two groups. Um, so I will run two meetings, uh, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday, to split the group into two so that all students who want to participate can be accommodated. And then there's a little bit more flexibility extended to staff because they can pivot back and forth between meetings based upon their av availability. It's a little bit more work, but the payoff, I think, has been excellent. Finally, as we approach the change portion of the toolkit, we're really thinking about feasibility of interventions and next steps. So for example, what is quite literally free to change on our campus? Um, and what interventions do, fee do folks feel a little bit tentative about making given the recent inter investments on this campus? So if we've just redesigned a space within the past year, do folks feel comfortable critiquing it if we find that it's not quite working the way that we had hoped it did, or if we find that there are some, I don't know, tinkering that could be done to that space. Not everybody feels comfortable um, leveling that critique at this time based on what projects have transpired. That being said, in terms of triumphs, um, I'm really impressed with the student participation and the level of vulnerability. Um, it is incredible to hear students speak so candidly about their experiences in a room full of staff, faculty, and administrators. So I'm really proud of that. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I was able to recruit students from the classroom directly who are prepared to have these conversations. I'm also really proud that we were able to pay students. Um, we're not able to hit quite as much money as St. Norbert's, um, but we still will be able to pay students thanks to a grant that we had this year. Again, as we are approach the change opportunities, um, I think we're poised to make meaningful interventions. For example, a student just last meeting had the idea to challenge students to maximize space in their dorm rooms, given the different configurations of dorm space we have on campus. And that's a free solution to just think about how you arrange your room. Um, are there opportunities to create more space, even though our dorm spaces are quite small? I think the task force has illuminated change and momentum that already exists so that this group at the end of the year, um, when we write recommendations, will be able to amplify the work of other campus partners rather than trying to do it ourselves. Finally, I'm really proud that we got this far. Um, we are actively considering steps for year two. And at this time, um, I can say that this is a feasible process to go through. We started in October, our last meeting of the year will be in late April, and I'm just so proud that we were able to facilitate this on this timeline. Thank you, Ashley. Um, wow, so if it wasn't exciting enough to write a book that people actually read, I think creating the toolkit that people are actually using, it's like hashtag goals, right? Um, so uh, Seamus and I have just a couple of wrap up comments and then we have time for some conversation. Um, I think first, uh, if we needed another reminder about the connection between how spaces are structured and inclusiveness, our um, forgetting to enable the closed captioning before the webinar began, just which we're, we're we made this mistake already once. And, and so we're, we really apologize, but I think it's also a reminder that like inequality can be built into spaces, but it can also be built out of spaces with some intentional thinking. Um, a few of the things that we've uh, learned uh, just from this initial uh, eight months with the cohort, um, it's really, really important to address burnout and to support staff. Um, people who are doing sexual assault prevention work and DEI work are holding the weight of the world on their hands. And um, it doesn't really work to say like, hey, do this really innovative thing, but also keep doing everything else you're doing. And so there needs to be high level support, not just for recognizing people doing innovation, innovative work, but also for taking something off their plates and making sure that somebody else is doing that work. Um, Paying the students, in retrospect, this is super obvious, but if you launch the work in a way that doesn't align with your institution's budget year, it's that much harder to get money. And so thinking about the timing of beginning the project, like it's not like we've never done a budget before at the institution, but so that was a, just an important logistical learning. Um, uh, 
it seems across campus, we've seen that, that there are opportunities to either use under leverage physical spaces or, or to bring people in. So we just want to really underline that in neither of the examples that, that we've shared is this about building palatial new dorms. It's really thinking about how to repurpose um, and reimagine what is already existing. So Seamus has a couple of thoughts and then um, we're going to actually have conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it, to build off what Jennifer just said about uh, bringing people in, um, other institutions have talked to us about how the focus on the allocation of space is a way to bring folks in often who have power and have control over that space. Um, often those people are sort of called out rather than brought in. Um, so an example here with sort of Greek life is thinking about people who have control over space in Greek-like organizations can be brought in and asked, like, how could the space that you have control over be used by other student organizations in ways that would help them feel more at home within the institution? That sort of makes those folks part of a solution and brings them into this process. Um, I think also this, you know, uh, it, we, we heard about this both from UMass Dartmouth and, and St. Norbert about how this is really widening a coalition. I'm sure that so many of these people are in contact already because, you know, they're all doing intersecting work all the time. Um, but hopefully, and what we've heard from other places is that people who are engaged with one another consistently and in doing these kinds of intersecting works are able to participate in a shared project. Um, uh, and, and that can be really powerful. And then I think, you know, we're excited about this as a research possibility. And, um, uh, you know, beyond the initial study, which is thinking about the kind of feasibility and accessibility of, of, of this, now asking like, what would it look like to evaluate the impact of something like this? And something Jennifer and I have talked a lot about is how difficult it is to look at sexual assault as an outcome variable because um, of how rarely it gets reported, about the challenges of measuring it. But I think you know what we're really describing here is a process to increase a sense of belonging on campus and a sense of equity on campus. And there are lots of things that we can look at, like you know, sleep as a form of uh, or a measure of inclusion on campus. So whether or not students from different kinds of social backgrounds are getting the same amount of sleep um, is a really good indication of and, and of sort of a sense of belonging and feeling cared for within an institution. So I think those are um, some of our reflections, both in terms of these really exciting descriptions and things that other people have said. But I think now is a nice time to open this up as a conversation. There are already some things within the Q&A but for those of you who are listening along, we'd encourage you to add additional things there if you have specific questions for the two institutions or for Brooke and Jennifer and me, we're really happy to take them right now. Yeah, so I think Seamus and I had a question which actually aligns perfectly with one of the questions from the audience, which is concretely, what might success look like? What would be an example of, and we don't want to scoop anyone, but like what might be an example that you feel comfortable sharing of a change that you might propose on your campuses? Um, either Ashley or go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, um, and Jess, feel free to add in. Um, and I see many of our St. Norbert colleagues here today. So thank you for being here. Um, we are just getting to the place of, the change portion of the space toolkit. And so I think we have some ideas of directions where some of this will go and what success could look like based off of that. But I just, two things that I wanted to share, um, you know, as a campus, I think we've made it really um, foundational that we have student voice in the work that we're doing um, to not just for space toolkit, but generally around gender-based violence prevention and response. And we had the idea come from some of the students in the space toolkit that they wanted to work with our campus administration to try and bring together all of the student organizations that are doing this work in some way, um, almost as just a collaborative opportunity to advocate and think about changes. And that's different. That's not something that we've had in recent years. And so I think that's a really good example of success. Um, we can give examples of some other things too later, but I wanted to give Ashley or Jess a chance to reply as well. 
I think success for me is going to be measured in sustainability. Um, I think the toolkit, what I appreciate most about it is that it's offering a more two-year intensive plan. Um, and then years three and four have, you know, you know, where you're looking at assessment, you're looking at reconvening, um, you're looking at paths forward. Um, I think a lot of ideas um, dissolve over the summer. And so I'm really looking to see um, if we can come back next fall with the same energy to follow through on some, again, we're at the same sort of point where we're looking at proposed changes. I don't know how much we'll actually be able to get done, but I think when everybody has a moment to catch their breath, once we're through with finals, um, the policy reviews that we're looking to engage with, um, you know, illuminating how space gets booked on our campus um, has come up and the politics of that I think are fascinating. Um, and it's the same, you know, whether I book a space or my students in a student group book a space, we're all using the same system. Um, but there's been some interesting um, barriers that have been presented. So just illuminating policy, I think, is has been a successful outcome um, that we will continue to pursue over the summer. Um, and again, I'm really looking forward to the work that we'll be able to continue to do and implement in year two. And I think that that point, Ashley, about space booking points to the layers of change that are possible. Seamus and I were visiting a campus recently, and they said their first take was all student groups have equal access to our party spaces. But then it turned out that, yes, like technically that's the case, but actually the sports teams are very organized and they know how to book the space. And the minute it opens up, they book. And so by the time you know, like X cultural society gets their act together to try to plan a party on Saturday night, there are no Saturday nights left. And so thinking about um, how institutional memory in student organization might amplify inequalities and then thinking like, okay, we have the whole interwebs, like there's probably a way that we can fix this. Um, or through training like this. So there are, there are ways, um, even in this conversation, I think that we've extended what it might mean to think about. It's not just changing physical spaces, it's changing policies about how those are um, accessed. Um, are there, I'm wondering, uh, Sarah, Jess, or Ashley, if you there's some changes that you can imagine, or Seamus or Brooke, from the conversations that we've had, of changes that might be free or low cost. Um, Sarah, I really want you to talk about the fire pits because you know I'm obsessed. <laughs> Our group has been just amazing at trying to problem solve from the very beginning. And um, one of the one of the concerns that we've um, that's been brought to light through this process is just the um, either lack of a lack of availability of space for gatherings of students, um, which like Ashley was just talking about and Jennifer was talking about might be related to booking policies, hours that buildings are open, those types of things. But also um, we're missing some like key gathering spaces in residence hall communities. There isn't a lot of common space, especially for a lot of our first year students. Um, and so one of the examples of kind of a low cost idea was um, thinking about fire pits around campus um, and some other just opportunities to bring students together and bring students outside for you know the two months a year that it's nice in Wisconsin, um, just to give oppor other opportunities for social gatherings outside of their rooms and houses. And I think for the high school question, we're gonna pivot to Seamus, our high school expert. Yeah, there was a, a question in the chat about, you know, are there lessons from this project that you can apply to middle or high school spaces? Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, this is sort of from the project and it's also just more generally from the work, you know, uh, high schools especially are just organized so hierarchically and they're organized hierarchically often in relationship to space. So some high schools will have classrooms that only seniors uh, can use, or they'll have rules where there's extra benefits given to seniors, where they're allowed to stay later or do a range of things that other students aren't allowed to do. And this also gets at the sort of like no cost intervention question, which is that like those rules could be changed, right? And one of the things that we do with middle school and high school students in giving them um, sort of privileges that other people don't have 
is augment really profound power inequalities of age, like the difference between an 18 year old and a 15 year old or 14 year old is really enormous. And if we do things that further empower people who already have a lot of power with our rules around high schools and middle schools, you know, it, 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 it can create really enormous harms be, be, because of the kinds of dynamics that we're thinking about. So if I were in a middle school or high school context, I would be like, you know, do we have rules where there's like a senior only space? Um, and, and what does that do? Or are there things that are happening on teams where say, you know, the first year people on the team have to sit somewhere on the travel bus because, you know, they're, they're young and the, the, the more senior people get to do something else. That really helps us sort of see some of this. There was also a question in the chat about, will this work at larger universities? And I would just note um, for now that we have several very large universities also going through this process. And um, I think in the months to come, we will be able to report back on that process. So um, Jennifer, Brooke and I picked a diversity of institutions, some in urban places, some in rural places, some that were public, some that were private, some that were very small, some that were very large, in order to kind of capture a range of institutions to assess um, feasibility. So um, I would say stay tuned on that one. I just want to add really quickly that, you know, in this sort of diversity of campuses that we've been working with, um, as I mentioned, sort of the creativity with which they're thinking about spaces and building community partnerships and both sort of on and off campus, right? We have examples of, of, of campuses who are partnering with their schools of hospitality to design courses around building, you know, uh, sort of uh, social spaces or bars, campus bars or pubs that can be sort of more better utilized by all members of the community. We have people who are thinking creatively about how to partner with off-campus institutions, either sort of social spaces or like bar spaces, but also off-campus housing to start conversations with people who are typically not involved in, in, in um, sort of this decision making about what space looks like, right? So I, I would say that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to think about what works in different spaces. As Seamus said, we have some campuses that are rural, some that are urban, you know, and sort of what those dynamics look like, what a college campus looks like varies, whether your campus is uh, has a high percentage of commuters and how you think about space in that regard. So I think we're going to have a lot of really interesting questions um, and hopefully some answers around, around how these things can uh, play out. And I see that it is 1258. Um, so we are, we realize that we haven't, this is like, we're sharing this with we, you, with you midway through the story. We don't have an end. We don't have the answers about what changes are possible all in, that will encompass all the changes that are possible. We still haven't told you if it works because we still don't know if it works. So we're excited that there's so many of you that are joining us on this journey. Um, if you're using the Space Toolkit and you're in the audience, please write to us and let us know. Seamus and I are easily findable online, as is Brooke. Um, uh, and I guess stay tuned for like the second chapter. Um, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you to our RAs. Um, and uh, be well, everyone. Take care. <laughs>